Okay, so just have a look at that together. This, the one you just looked at was the complex of Goharshad and, and Mashhad. Actually, I'm not even sure that I explained too well about Goharshad in the last class. We didn't mention her at all. She was the wife of Shahrukh. And she's exceptional in many ways. She was the single most important patron of architecture within his reign, more so than the, uh, the Sultan himself. And she also remained a formidable political figure in the landscape uh, after Shah Rukh's death. In fact, she was uh, put to death for uh, trying to arrange the succession of a particularly favored son. Uh, another member of the family objected to this and uh, had her executed. So that's a measure of just how formidable a woman she was. And that's also reflected in the architecture that she erected. Uh, so we have uh, a second complex, this time in the capital, Herat. And there are two major components of it, a madrasa and a mosque. This particular watercolor is a reproduction of one that's in the in the office library in London. It was done by a member of the Afghan Boundary Commission in 1885. Uh, what was happening then? Well, this is the time of the so-called great game. This is nothing to do with football or anything else like that. This is when Russia and Britain were competing for uh, spheres of influence within the Middle East. And we had Russia coming down from the north, taking control of uh, places that today are independent, like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan. And we had Britain coming from India in the northwest direction, uh, having made Afghanistan, not uh, certainly not a colony, but uh, it was part of their sphere of influence. And the Russians, it was thought, were going to come further south from their, uh, their territory in Uzbekistan towards Afghanistan. Uh, so yes, there was a boundary commission who was operating at the same time, but there was also a great fear that the Russians would carry on to Herat. And so the British advised the governor of Herat that these buildings that you see here would provide cover for Russian guns to be able to shell the city. They're a little bit outside of the main walled city. And they sort of recommended, well, better knock them down just in case they, uh, they use them. Which is tragic because this is uh, one of the finest ensembles of uh, Timurid architecture that was ever built. They, and they just ordered it to... They advised the emir who, of course, agreed with their recommendation and had his men blow it up. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's tragic. There is a little bit left, which, and the little bit left shows you just how much we missed uh, what we're looking at here is the Pishtak, the entrance arch, already in ruins, of course, of the entrance to the madrasa, one of the minarets of the madrasa, and then behind it a little bit, you see the Qibla Iwan of the mosque and uh, one of the minarets of the mosque. This looks like a series of little rooms beside a courtyard, and uh, that's how it has been reconstructed in this plan of the complex, which actually is based from the, the sketch we were looking at by Durand. Uh, the viewpoint is over here. So in the solid lines, we had the Pishtak, uh, the minaret. This, fortunately, is still standing. This is a mausoleum within the madrasa. And this is what we saw in the background. But although it's drawn as little rooms here, what I feel is more likely is that we're looking at uh, a mosque that had a, an arrangement something like this. It had uh, a false facade on the courtyard. So, I mean, if, it, if this was ruined and you were looking at it from the back, it might look something like this. So it probably was a mosque fairly close to the one in Mashhad that we saw. 
So yes, fortunately there is still uh, one of the main components, which is a mausoleum that was part of the madrasa. Now this is a common uh, combination in Timurid architecture. And it eventually became the dynastic mausoleum of the Timurids in Herat. This is where most of the, the family was buried, where Shah Rukh, Gohar Shad, and uh, many of their descendants. And here's a section of it. <coughs> Anything different about the building from the section? Uh, yeah, we now have three shells instead of two. We've had two before. We've had the upper one to make it more impressive from the outside. We've had the lower one to give it proportional height. Why the third one? Structure. Yeah, probably some sort of structural strengthening. That would make most sense here. Uh, but uh, these lines here represent brick ribs that you have in the top as well. We had those in the earliest of the series, the Guri Amir in Samarkand as well. And we'll have a look at the interior and at the system of vaulting in particular here, which uses, as you can see, lots of intersecting arches. So that's a, a new system of vaulting, really, that uh, we haven't come across before. So we have intersecting arches. They form small kite-shaped compartments. And then there's a Mokarna's zone of transition at the top, which leads to a, a shallow circular dome. You can see the dome here in the section. Uh, and this is the walls of the main square, but each side of the main square has a recess. So you can see that rather better on the plan of the mausoleum here. And you can look at the main intersecting arches here. They go across from here to here on each side of the main square. And this produces a square of a smaller diameter than that of the room uh, that supports it. And then they have simple corner squinches here and then Mokarnas leading up to the central dome. So it's a, a rather more complicated form of vaulting. Uh, Probably like the false facade that we had in Mashhad, it is just a facade. There's probably not much structure behind this system, uh, but it certainly looks very impressive. And on the outside, it's also extensively decorated. Any parallels that you notice in the Decoration of the dome, or the shape of the dome? It's ribbed, it's yes. A little bit different that the ribs aren't contiguous. They're not actually touching one another. Mm -hmm. They're separated a bit for variety. Uh, different kinds of tile work being used here. It's not easy to make it out because of the, uh, uh, you need to go closer up really to be sure of the technique, but they're using tile mosaic on these lower panels. And these upper ones, you can probably see from where tiles are missing uh, that it can't be tile mosaic because they're rectangular tiles were used in these spaces. And these, in fact, were overglaze painted, uh, or cor de seca, as they also call it. And uh, yeah, there are mokarnas at the base of the, the ribs leading up to the, they are, what did you say, Isabel? Impressive? Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they're also, in fact, the Mokarnas made of uh, Coeur de Seca, these overglaze painted tiles. So those two represent the, the finest buildings that were erected in the reign of Shah And that's the surprise that they were erected by his wife, Gohar Shad, not by himself. So that's exceptional. But there is a... Uh, one still remaining building erected by Shah Rukh that is impressive, and that is the, the Hazira of Gazurga. Now, Hazira, that's a term that we haven't come across in uh, our architecture before. What does Hazira mean in Arabic? Um, 
That's a, a razi maybe you're thinking of? Yeah. No, it's not the same root. Okay. What's a hazira in, in modern Arabic anyway? Uh, like an animal enclosure. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the original use of it, or the use of it here, is also related to this idea of an enclosure. Uh, it's used to describe a uh, surround for a grave, not one usually that has a uh, roof on it, but just an opener surround. Uh, and that's what it's called in, in some of the sources here. Now, the plan of this, well, what do you think the plan looks like? That's a courtyard in the middle. That's a large courtyard in the middle. And you have two, mar it's symmetrical around this, this axis. That's right around the axis from the entrance leading up to the big E1 here that's opposite the entrance. It's similar to like a 41 plan. Exactly. Very similar to a 41 madrasa plan. What's unusual about it, though, if, if it was a madrasa, what would you expect? The court is very big. Certainly, the court's very big. Exactly. You would have rooms all around the courtyard. In fact, I'm just going to jump forward a little bit because we're going to look at a, a, another madrasa. And here's an example of one from the Timurid period. It's a little bit later. Uh, so the, the ground floor is here on the left. And you have a 4 iwan plan, just like the Gazurga Hazira. But the rooms don't stop at this point. They continue all the way around. So. Why don't we have them here? In a sense, it's connected with this, which is the tomb of uh, Abdullah Ansari, a saint who was buried there. It was also a place of pilgrimage. And so this is a building that commemorates him. But in a sense, it's a kind of monumentalization of a tomb surround. So this kind of railing that they would have had in, in earlier buildings has now become a huge wall with an Ewan in front of the tomb, framing your gaze as you come through the entrance. But they also made it a place for Sufis to reside in, Islamic mystics. Uh, and they had cells to live in. They had a masjid. A uh, place to pray in, and they had a jama'at khane, a uh, place to gather in perhaps for recitations. And we know about these names from descriptions in contemporary sources of the shrine that was built there. Uh, so that's the ground plan. This is a view of the courtyard. Uh, the, the tomb has a green metal surround added much later, of course. But you can see from the cluster of graves in the courtyard that it was considered a great honor to be buried close to a saint. You acquired some of his, his baraka, his grace, his blessings, perhaps, that way. And so it's absolutely filled uh, with some very fine tombstones, including some on a platform that belong to the family of the Timurids in Herat, and which are among the best of them. The next photograph is taken looking from the, the top of the EYN here back in the other direction. And you can see behind the wall on this side of the side EYNs, there are no rooms, but there are rooms on the other side. And this is where the mosque would have been. This is where the, uh, the assembly room for the Sufis was. And the one after this, it's a detail of the Iwan. We're looking at the detail of the one on the inside. Anything interesting here? Hello? Yellow? Yellow? Uh, yeah, these are a bit, bit yellower in color than the usual, that's true. Uh, but these, in fact, are really unglazed brick rather than glazed tiles. So it's just the, the color of the brick that makes it look different. Mm -hmm. Is it the inscription going around in the 
Well, this is interesting. Yes, this goes around this square, and in the square, what do you have? You have mini squares, and they have they have more inscriptions in square Kufic. So it's inscriptions within inscriptions. One of them says hi. The one. Yeah. Yeah, this one. This one does. Yes, and here it's in these four compartments. Uh, also, by the way, just something that you might recognize are, are figures 832. This is the Hejra date in which it was built. That's the equivalent of 1428. So and that's at the end of the inscription there. OK, the last uh, monument we're going to look at today in architecture is the Madrasa at Khargird, uh, the Giothea, built by Pir Ahmad Khafi, who was a vizier. Uh, now, Khaf is a town, or nowadays a village, which is beside Khargird. They're both very close to one another. And they're quite a bit, they're about 100 kilometers or so away from Herat. So the surprising thing is that this is built in the middle of the countryside. Uh, you weren't here last class? Oh, it's the same one? Yes. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, it's a building that's surrounded by open countryside. It's not in an urban area like the, the capital Herat. But you would have thought if he wanted to gain prestige that that's where he would have built it. So why situate it in this fairly remote location? Isabel? Is that where the was born? That's where he was born. But the connection is probably to do with the lands that he held in the area. Uh, the lands that he owned probably would have been made waqf. They would have been endowed to the building. And the revenue from them, uh, they reckon that the further away the lands are from the building, the more chance there is of someone stealing some of the revenue. So if you have the building beside the revenue generating property, then you are more likely to uh, to hold all of the legally due money that was coming to support the upkeep of the building and the properties. So here's the plan of the, the ground floor and the upper floor. Any, what's the basic form of the plan? It's a four Iwan courtyard. But before you enter the courtyard, you have something as well. What do you have before you enter the courtyard? Two large rooms. Uh, in this case, it, it looks very much like the mausoleum of uh, the previous one, but it probably was used as a lecture hall. Mm -hmm. But this has a little mihrab, which, uh, let's see, the, yeah, the compass indication isn't there, but this is Qibla oriented. So uh, yes, this was used as a mosque. But there's no actual connection from any of these buildings into the rooms in the interior, uh, except through the vestibule. So this is a kind of separate entrance complex all of its own. Uh, let me just go back then, sorry, and look at the entrance facade. Well, think of a building like the, uh, the Bibi Khano Mosque in Samarkand that we looked at. Is this different in any way in its approach general approach? No. Well, it has two fairly low domes, which are unglazed. The Bibi Khanum had one, well, it had three, in fact, uh, which rested on tall drums and all had tile work on them. 
Anything else that strikes you as immediately being different? No fake facades? Uh, no, in this case, they're not fake facades. But I'm really thinking of the horizontality of the building. Mm -hmm. It's much lower. It's not trying to impress you with its, its mass, its bulk as the buildings of Timur were, or even those of Goharashad. Uh, and there's a very attractive rhythm here. You have uh, the main emphasis is on the Iwan, that's the entrance portal. You have two towers at the end. We don't know how high they went up originally, whether they were minarets or not, but they may not have gone up much higher. And you have a group of three arches in between, of which the middle one is the tallest. The other two are slightly lower in height. So it's a, uh, a rhythm that builds up in this kind of pyramidal effect towards the center. And that's uninterrupted by the domes, which are fairly low. They don't compete with the, uh, the main Iwan. Are those two minarets? We don't know. Uh, there's no indication there was a staircase there. I think myself they probably just went as high as the wall and not any higher. We're going to look at the building, uh, the room that is found under this dome on the left-hand side. So it's under this part of the building. And this looks like which one that we've just seen? Which was what? What was it? Just have a look so that you can remember the connection. Yeah, the complex of Goharashad. That's the wife of uh, Shorokh, remember. So the mausoleum that she built. And here we have the same system of intersecting arches. Although there's a difference here, and that is the way in which the, the niches that are off the main square, they also have ribs that link with the ribs off the main square. So you get this impression of the the weight of the dome being conveyed through these ribs down to the stability of the lower parts of the walls. A bit like Gothic architecture. Uh, and the ribs, well, they can look different from different angles. Here you're looking at it from the corner. What's interesting here as well is the way in which the, the previous strict three-part division, tripartite division of base, zone of transition and dome, it's getting blurred here. The zone of transition and the dome, they're almost blending into one another. Uh, and the, the vaulting leads to a little octagonal lantern with uh, what looks like a very light dome, although this is partially a kind of visual illusion because the the octagon that you have here. You have uh, windows with what looked like straight sides coming back. But the, uh, from down below, you only see the very narrow part of the support of the, the pier for the dome just here. Uh, but in fact, it goes back in a triangular form and is, is much more solid. That's how it's able to support the dome at that point. And this is achieved again by the same kind of system of intersecting ribs that we had in the Goharashad mausoleum in Herat. So basic square, intersecting ribs produce a smaller square uh, than simple squinches lead up by Mokarnas to the octagon. Uh, and that's where you have the little lantern. OK, uh, we're going to stop there with architecture. And we're going to uh, move on to Timurid arts. The Islamic East in the year of Behzad's birth, 1465. Who's Behzad? Anyone heard of him? 
He's the most famous painter from the Timurid period, a book painter. We'll come across his works very shortly. So the, the light blue shows you the range of the Timurid Empire at this stage. Uh, Herat here is the capital. And they still rule over Central Asia, Samarkand, Bukhara, most of Afghanistan. Uh, there are other Turkmen tribes who, in the meantime, have taken control of southern, central, and northwestern Iran. And then uh, further to the west, there are the Ottomans and the Mamluks as well. We'll go back to the reign of Timur. Uh, just to have a look at a couple of examples of metalwork that were produced during this period. The one on the left is a candlestick from uh, a large shrine that was built by Timur in, uh, in what is now Kazakhstan in, in Central Asia. And it's also, it's difficult to get an estimation of the size from this photograph, but it's, it's much bigger than the usual. It goes up to about waist height on someone. And uh, like the finest earlier examples, it has inlaid gold and silver. You can see the inlaid gold and silver rather better on a wine mug on the right hand side. Uh, there are many have, that have survived with this shape and this kind of decoration from uh, Timur and Patronage. Some of them specifically say they were made in Herat. So, and many of them, like this one also, have Persian poetry on them. That's a significant difference from many of the earlier examples, which normally had just uh, inscriptions in Arabic. Now Persian, the uh, literary language of the court, is uh, becoming much more common on works of art, and occasionally in architecture as well. Also, it's worth noticing just the, the very fine arabesques that decorate almost all of the surface of this uh, wine jug. Uh, this is a much more delicate type of decoration than is common on earlier types as well. Oops, sorry, we should be uh, looking at the whole screen. That's better. You're supposed to shout at me if, if I forget something like this. <laughs> okay. Something here should look familiar to you. The one on the right. What was it? We had it in an earlier class. Not Chinese, no. No, although there are Chinese-influenced elements like the clouds in the sky. Yeah. It's a Shahnameh illustration. When, where was this one on the right-hand side done? Uh, we didn't, we started looking at painting mostly in the 14th. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it was, uh, the wolf has horns on it, that's significant. Yes, that's part of the original story that's in the Shahnameh. This was a Jalayarid example from the second half of the 14th century. This was the dynasty that ruled over northwest Iran. Uh, the original is in an album that's in the top Kapi Sarai. What we have on the left hand side is a painting from the Shahnameh that was commissioned by Baisonghor Ibn Shahrukh. Okay, if you have a look at your handout, this is the first one on the list. Uh, 1425, we have a date for this. And it says, Tehran Gulistan Palace Library. Now, supposing in a slide test, I'm asking you, 
for the basic information on, on a work of art, which is the name, the date, the patron, the location. What's the location of this one? No. What I want is the Herat, is the place where it was made. Tehran happens to be the place where it ended up in modern times. That's not relevant for the, uh, for the uh, art historical analysis of it at this point. So, I mean, I identify the, the library that it's in at the moment, but uh, these are under Timur and Herat. That's the category that's most important. So all these are? Uh, not all of them. There's one further down the list that says Akkoyunlu Turkmen Tabriz, for instance. And I have a album paintings question mark, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're not all Herat, no. Okay, so obviously the one on the left is uh, not exactly a copy, but uh, it's, it's very closely based on the one on the right. What's different about it? I, I can't hear you. There's a what? A horn. A horn? Well, the, this, the, the, it's not quite so apparent here, but the uh, wolves also have horns. Yeah, it's flat. Okay, it's flat. That, that's, that's an important point. There's a less attempt to depict uh, perspective in the landscape. There's the some sense of depth here, but almost none on the left. Yeah, there's some modeling. In fact, uh, the fur changes color to give you uh, a sense of the bulk of the body. And yes, it's much more monochromatic, single color on the left. Anything else that's different? Where is his tail? What? The tail. What tail? I can't find his tail. Oh, the tail has no, changed. Oh, uh, the tail of the guy. Position. Uh, okay, yes, he has a leopard uh, tail here, which is missing at that point. They haven't bothered with it. Isabel, you? Uh, no clouds. No clouds. Instead, what do we have? We have Fighting. birds flying in the sky. Uh, we have, look at the plants. Yeah, different plants. Different plants. They are blossoming. They're in springtime. Uh, and in fact, from this point onwards, that's always the case. The uh, landscape, no matter how bloody the action that may be taking place in it, it's always in a springtime, almost fairy tale like landscape. Uh, another little bit of difference. Look at the position of this wolf. It's been moved now to the other side of this wolf, which, I mean, makes it fit more easily in the composition, but at the same time, it's it's no longer a threat. Here, there's a potential threat from the wolf, so it adds to the drama of the scene, but that's been lost in this uh, positioning. So I think he moved it and he called it needs to fit. Yeah, he, he moved it just because it's easier to fit in the composition, that's right. Not uh, realizing the, the harm this would do th to the dramatic intensity of the scene. And similarly, it's, a, it's not clear because the resolution isn't fine enough, but the gaze of uh, Isfandiar is over here somewhere. He's not actually looking at the wolf that he's supposedly about to kill. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> quite so obviously a combat between the two. So again, the, uh, the tension that you felt in the earlier one has been lost a bit. Excuse me. I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, so obviously, they admired this one enough to want to copy it. And that tells us a lot, too, about uh, the attitude towards originality in painting. You didn't have to have an original composition to be a good painter. In fact, it showed respect for the tradition if you did copy an earlier one closely. Uh, and I'll just show you another example of this in the same manuscript. Uh, there are three paintings altogether that were closely copied from earlier examples. And uh, that 
applies to many later examples of Timur and Burg painting. So here's one of uh, a couple enthroned with uh, women serenading them by music and offering them food. That's from the Baison Gour the 1425 one. We didn't look at this one earlier, but this is one from the Jalayarid Shahname earlier on. So, what are the differences here? Yeah, there, there are more brighter primary colors that are used in the Baison Hori example. Hmm? They added an inscription onto the outside of the architectural frame, the wall. Uh, yeah, again, there's a bit more attempt at some sort of three-dimensional rendering of space here. It's, it's lost to a large extent on the left-hand side. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid it doesn't quite show because of the resolution of the projector. I can see it a little better on the monitor. There is an attempt to depict some of the uh, uh, inlay work in the door, which isn't visible. I'm sorry, it's just part of the quality. So there is very fine, high quality work there, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not, in a sense, as realistic as the earlier Jalayarid example. The same manuscript also has a double page frontispiece. You remember what a frontispiece is? OK, tell us what it is. The opening page of a book, which frequently has just an illustration, frequently without any text at all. And the subject matter of the painting in the frontispiece doesn't have to be related to the text within it. What do you think we're looking at here? Mm, when was this? When was this? Uh, when was this made? What's the date this was made? 1425. So Timur has been dead now for 20 years or so. I mean, we have a figure, a beardless figure on the carpet who seems to be the most important person in the composition. So what's happening around him? A feast. A feast, yeah. They're bringing uh, food and drink. We have courtiers. Uh, so who do you think this figure is? Which prince? By Songkhor, the patron of the manuscript, very likely. And we have other frontispieces from manuscripts that he commissioned in which the, the figure looks very similar, a round-faced, unbearded youth. So this is, you know, an early example, very likely, of a portrait. Uh, a little bit idealized, probably, but uh, uh, that's probably uh, what they're trying to depict. Is the fact that the, white, the, the floor is white? The, the ground. The ground is yeah. Is it snowing or is it sand? No, 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 it's just... Uh, just another way of depicting grass or the kind of rocky landscape. It's also in flower with lots of birds flying around the edges, uh, like the other examples. Uh, another manuscript that was commissioned by him is uh, Kalila and Dimna. Uh, we had some of these stories in the Jalayarid period. This is one uh, of a chapter which talks about the battles of the owls versus the crows. And uh, the owls attacked the crows, first of all, and the crows hit upon a plan to get revenge by implanting a spy in the middle of the crow's midst. So one uh, 
Crow volunteered to become the spy and he's trying to persuade the Crows to uh, accept him as part of their team. So that's what's happening here. This is the whole page. We have quite a bit of text, but also there's extensive use of the margin. You can see some of the details rather better there. And it's, uh, again, very much a fairy tale kind of landscape. On realistic colors, these dark purple, light blue, a bit like a coral uh, reef almost. But it's still very impressive in the uh, rendering of the, the feathers and the features of the owls and the crow. Uh, almost a metallic feeling in its accuracy of depiction, but not the same kind of perhaps uh, emotional involvement that we had in the Jilairid uh, Kalila Wadimna paintings. And the same applies to this. We did have this same subject in one of the Jilairid Kalila Wadimnas, what's happening here. Yeah, the, the jackals, Kalila, tricked the lion and the bull into fighting to the death. And the, the bull who was the rival of Dimna for the vizier, the chief friend of the lion, was killed. Uh, what we're missing in the detail here is some of the blood that's flowing out from the wounds sustained by the bull. But the same kind of fairy tale like landscape is visible in the background with uh, flowers and uh, an unrealistic kind of color. Sorry, this is black and white. I uh, don't have a color photograph of the original. Uh, Dana, how does this compare with earlier examples we've been looking at today? Yeah, it's fairly conventional, still little tufts of grass with a few larger flowering bushes in it. And think they're more realistic, I guess. Mm, not sure if they're that realistic. What a, this actually doesn't show the, uh, the complete page. But if I had a depiction of the complete page, it would probably be let's say something like this with the, the picture taking up maybe uh, this amount of space. So how would that compare with the examples we've seen? It's horizontal. That's unusual at this stage. The others have been vertical and they've been taking up much more of the page as well. What earlier manuscripts that we looked at had this kind of format? Anyone who was here in the first class that we did? Because we have to go all the way back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we had that in an earlier manuscript. Yeah, the book of history. Exactly, the Jamea Tabarich, yeah. the compendium of histories, which was uh, done for the Ilkhanids. Now, this was done for Shah Rukh by his court historian. It's called the Majmua Tabarikh, the, uh, another collection of histories. And it's uh, an extension of the previous one. It carries the story on from the Mongols up to the Timurids, bringing them within the same line. And this, in fact, at this time is an archaic way of depicting uh, figures in painting. It's old-fashioned. Why? Presumably because they thought that uh, just by the text emphasizing the contu continuation of the Timurids as followers of the Ilkhanids, uh, the style of painting should match the earlier manuscript as well. This is another way of reaffirming their legitimacy. So, it's interesting that there were different styles of painting in operation uh, 
in the Timurid period. We have one that was uh, normal for literary manuscripts and a different one that was operating for historical manuscripts. Now here's something very different again from the same period. Black and gold. Black and gold, and what's the alphabet that you have below it? Uh, not quite Mongol, but close. It's a form of Turkish, yes. This is Uyghur. Okay, that's a word you probably haven't come across before. U-I-G-H-U-R is how you spell it. It's a, a, a Turkish tribe that were living in what is today uh, Western China, so Eastern Central Asia. And they were employed as scribes by the Timurids. Uh, there are a few other manuscripts written in this kind of script uh, that were produced, but this is the only illustrated one. And it's a uh, miraj nome. You know what the miraj is? The night journey of Muhammad. <coughs> okay, when he went up into heaven and came back again. And he was shown uh, heaven and hell by various angels on the way. So this is one of him riding Burak, the, the steed, the human-headed horse that he rode upon at the time, with the angel showing him uh, some of the sinners who are being uh, tortured in hell. That's the demon. He's in charge of the torturing, and these are the, uh, the sinners who are being consumed by the flames of hell. It also has happy pictures of heaven. <laughs> so it's not all doom and gloom. This is the first time I see that much black. Uh, you're right, it is unusual. So it's an, some kind of attempt to depict uh, unlimited space in the background. There's a facsimile of this manuscript that's in the Rare Book Library if you're interested in uh, looking at more examples. Ah, here we have one of the treasures of Egypt. It's actually a manuscript that is now preserved in the Dar al Qutb, the National Library here in Cairo. And it's one of the finest uh, examples of Persian painting because it has the signature of that same artist I mentioned earlier, Behizad, on several of the paintings. But this is the well, what do you think this is? What's the term for this part of the manuscript? <coughs> no text. It's a frontispiece. And what does it show? Or who's the main person in it? Yeah, this person. This is Sultan Hussein, under whose reign it was, uh, it was written. So this is the Saadi Bustan. Sadi is a Persian port. Bustan is the name of the manuscript. It was for Sultan Hussein. We have a date, 1488, and it's in the National Library or the Dar al Qutb here in Cairo. So we have a, well, it's a feast, perhaps, or a, an entertainment with uh, Sultan Hussein seated outside an octagonal garden pavilion in a paved courtyard but he also has his trellis tent beside him. He's a nomad, so in fact, even close to an urban setting, they frequently liked to live in tents. This was luxurious living for them. Uh, we have musicians, Sufis. This one is perhaps in some kind of religious ecstasy. He's tearing uh, the clothes from his breast. Uh, musicians on the left-hand side the wine bearer on the left. Somebody has had a little bit too much to drink, so he's having to be escorted out, supported by uh, two figures to either side. He didn't arrive with his invitation card, so he's not allowed to come in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's getting beaten, and uh, they're bringing even more drink here from the, the still, perhaps, that is at the uh, the little building on the top right hand side. So nothing here directly related to the, the text. 
Uh, but here's one from the, within the manuscript. This actually has the signature of Behzad in a very inconspicuous place in this little rectangle here. Yeah, how big are the manuscripts? How old are they? How big are they? How big are they? Uh, it, it can vary. This particular one, let me see, it's about this size. I mean, you'll, you'll get in, in the reproductions in the textbook uh, and in other books, they, they give the exact dimensions, but it may be about uh, 30, 35 centimeters high, perhaps. Miniatures is sometimes how they're described, but that's not really accurate. They're, they're much bigger than, than very small paintings. This takes up, as you can see, almost the whole height of the page. <coughs> what do you think this shows? Zainab. What are we looking at? How many people are in it? How many figures do you see in the painting? How many figures? How many figures, yes. It's not a trick question. Two or three. <laughs> well, two. Here's one, here's another. It's a scene supposedly taking place in Egypt. <laughs> if that helps. Not that it looks very Egyptian. So. We have someone with a flame halo. What does that tell you? It's a holy person. And we have, in fact, a woman who is lunging at him. Why would she be doing that? He's leaving, yes, yes. <laughs> and she doesn't want him to. This is the attempted seduction of Yusuf by Zulekha. Okay, familiar story from the Quran. Uh, when suddenly the seven locked doors that he was behind sprang open and he was able to escape her. So this ad, you might notice here, has set this within a very complicated architectural framework with lots of diagonals, lots of doors de depicted, and we get a, an impression of claustrophobia. Uh, it's a way in which the design, the architecture, is heightening the psychological tension of the image. And uh, the details of the decoration on the doors, for instance, I think this also adds to the, the busyness of certain parts of it to indicate the uh, the trap that Zuleikha has set for Yusuf. So it's a, a very interesting uh, depiction of this particular subject. And we have some other manuscripts uh, which feature Behzad as well. This is the next one on your list, the Khamsa of Nizami for an emir. It's dated to 1494, a little bit later. It's now in London, but of course Herat still is the, the place where it was done. And this depicts an episode uh, where uh, the caliph, the Abbasid caliph, was having a discussion with someone in a bath. So in fact, the, uh, really the only part of the story that needed to be illustrated for the purpose of the text is this little segment on the left. Everything else that we have here is what Behzad gave us just for fun. What about the style of this compared, say, with the, the Baisan Hori paintings, the Shahnameh paintings? Is there any difference that you can see? A door. Well, I mean, doors we have in all of them. Yeah, I know. It's like out of the frame. Out of the frame. Well, yes, that's true. Uh, uh, it's a different use of the manuscript. I suppose this is the entrance to the bath hall. Yeah? There's more patterns? Uh, more geometrical patterns, yes, yes. For the interiors, that's uh, more noticeable. It's more, the colors are more monochromatic. A little bit less bright, perhaps, than uh, some of the Bison Gori ones. There's more of an attention to real life those little details there to the 
Yes, the, the kind of uh, details of everyday life, as in a genre scene, are uh, more evident here than in the, uh, uh, the bicep gory ones. The figures aren't quite so stiff as well and formal. They're in more natural, more relaxed poses. So it's been noted that there's a general drift towards realism in these examples. So all he needed to show us was the, the man at the bath being shaved, being washed, but he's given us the, the undressing room here, the clothes piled uh, on a carpet on one side. He's given us the, the people working here and the, uh, this wonderful accent of the blue towels hung up to dry on the ceiling and someone reaching for them with a long pole. Uh, compositionally, it's a very unusual and ambitious uh, uh, attempt to enliven the scene. Mind you, there's one s detail which I've never been quite uh, able to figure out. <laughs> Two white squares with uh, circular multi-colored uh, parallel stripes in them. I don't know <laughs> if anyone comes up with uh, an interpretation of those that is uh, plausible. I'm be interested to hear it. Yeah, yeah, they do, but uh, but I don't think that's what they are. They they didn't make uh, curved lines in parallel for windows at this time. So, mm, so, well, most other things here in this seem to depict something that existed in real life. So uh, I assume this does too, but exactly what I'm not sure. That's a mystery to me still. Here's one from also from the same manuscript. It depicts the, the building of a, uh, a pre-Islamic castle. And again, it's wonderfully realistic in terms of the kinds of activities that occurred in contemporary architecture. So we have scaffolding made of wood tied together with rope, just as it would have been then. We have uh, people bringing uh, bricks on their back, mixing up mortar, putting it into troughs that are being carried up to the people who are working on, the, uh, on top of the Iwan. And that might be remind you of something we've seen already. Zainab, does this look familiar? What does this show? You don't remember? Anyone? The building of the mosque at Samarkand. And uh, this is also by Behzad. It's from, uh, in fact, an historical manuscript, the, the book of the, uh, the victories of Timur, the Zafar Name. And some of the figures here in this area, mixing up mortar and carrying bricks on their back, they're, uh, they're almost identical to the earlier one. Uh, Now, on the map at the beginning of the class, I showed you the, uh, the realm that was occupied by the Timurids. And then to the west, in central northwestern Iran, there were uh, other dynasties <laughs> in power. And the Akkayunlu, uh, a Turkmen tribe, controlled Iran at this stage. Uh, their capital was Tabriz, and that's probably where this manuscript was painted. This is another Khamsa of Nizami. And this shows uh, a prince in a pavilion being waited upon by, uh, by various uh, princesses. So, uh, so uh, Dana, anything uh, different about this from the other examples? Well, the way it's painted, or just the general layout? Too many colors. It's a lot more vibrant. 
Yeah, it's a lot more bright and they're using lots of different colors again for the, uh, the rocks that are in the stream and the types of flowers that surround it. Might be a little bit oversaturated, the reproduction here. You can't always rely upon the, uh, what you see in a book to, uh, to be sure that it's like the original. Sometimes they exaggerate the colors. But, but this is all you've got to go on, so. <laughs> Uh, yes, the nature seems a bit wilder than in the uh, tidier compositions that we have, <coughs> say, in the Herat school. Uh, one other interesting thing to notice just is the dark blue strip that you have here. What's this? This is the sky, but we also have the sky behind the landscape here. This is the area that was the original text space. So within that, they have a different color for the sky. And that's a way of helping you distinguish what's spilling out into the margin. And here's another one from the, the same manuscript, uh, Nada. What about this one? How does this compare, say, with the Herat ones of Behzad? It's another in the series of a, a prince in a pavilion being ministered to by some ladies. <coughs> what about them? It's, um, it's different. How is it different? Uh, maybe for uh, the prince and the area around him, but the landscape, not to the same extent, I think. Well, there's a lot going on here in the background. People hunting, shooting uh, towards a leopard, another one looking towards them. There is a groom waiting with a horse in the, uh, in the, <coughs> vegetation and rocks on the side. Again, I think the depiction of nature here is a bit wilder than, uh, than is typical in the Herat example. So that's one way perhaps of distinguishing between the two. Okay, well we, uh, we really don't have time to go into this segment of the lecture today in detail. I'll probably do that later, but uh, this is what we'll be looking at next class and others like it. What does this strike you as? <laughs> Very influenced by where the wild things are. <laughs> <laughs> the possibility, of course, is that uh, Sendak saw images like this <laughs> and uh, based his demons on them. That's a, a very popular children's book in, uh, in America. They actually made a film of it a few years ago, which, uh, which has lots of demons looking rather like this in it. Well, they are demons. These are demons, yeah. <laughs> These are demons uh, uh, rather than humans. What sort of context do you think this is in? What's, what's all this writing around them? Mm -hmm. No, it's actually examples of fine calligraphy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a page from one of the Istanbul albums, uh, which is a kind of scrapbook <laughs> where they collected oh, both sorry calligraphy and paintings and they just pasted them on without necessarily them having any relationship to one another. So when you have these at, a, at an angle uh, and none of the texts here relate at all to this painting. That's part of the problem that we have in interpreting these paintings because there isn't any original text on the paintings and none of the other texts in the album or anywhere else seem to relate in particular to the stories. But 
Is it a doll? No, it's it's a no, it's like a golden perfume holder, a little golden bottle of some kind. Yeah, that he's holding. Uh, so these are the paintings that are referred to as Siyah Kalam. I think we had uh, this, this term in uh, connection with some paintings from the Divan of Sultan Ahmed earlier. Anyone remember what Qalasiyah means? Black pen, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so we'll start off uh, looking at his paintings in the next class and we'll stop there today. <laughs>